welcome to the Madden America podcast, your source for science, psychiatry, and social justice. Welcome to Madden America Radio, military veterans and veterans' families. Today we have Paula J. Kaplan, clinical and research psychologist at the Du Bois Institute at Harvard University, author of When Johnny and Jean Came Marching Home, documentary filmmaker, and a passionate and steadfast advocate for service members, veterans, and their families. Paul, welcome and thanks. thank you so much for joining our podcast today. Oh, thank you so much for inviting me. I love the work you're doing. Well, thank you so much. Very kind of you. Well, um, I guess I'd like to get started by really just asking this question that I ask everyone as we uh, begin talks about veterans, mental health, uh, service members, their families, issues they're facing, which is really, how did you get started in all of this? Well, my la- I'm 72 years old, to tell you what generation I come from, and my late father, Jerome A. Kaplan, that served in World War II. He was captain of the nine a captain in the 969th Field Artillery Battalion uh, in the Army, and um, uh, that was an outfit. That was when the service uh, was still segregated. Uh, the Army was and. Uh, So they had white officers. My father was white, Jewish, and from the north, from Hartford, Connecticut. Uh, And all the enlisted soldiers were black. And I I was very close to my father. Um, He was a really fine man and a wonderful storyteller. And I grew up listening to him tell stories especially about the time around the Battle of the Bulge. Uh, He and his men landed at Normandy on July 9th, um, so it was weeks after D-Day, and then they fought what was called the Battle of the Hedgerows uh, and ended up at Bastogne at the Battle of the Bulge in December. And so every year when I was growing up, when, when it was around Christmas time, so around an anniversary of the Battle of the Bulge, My father would say, you know, 18 years ago tonight or 20 years ago tonight, and then he would tell these stories every year. And as I say, he was a wonderful storyteller, and I I just I loved listening to his stories. Like most veterans, he never told any story that included uh, him being courageous or smart or or anything um, or or frightened. Um, he just, he told these very fond stories about the men he served with, or he would tell amusing little stories. And what happened was, as I say, we were very close. Every year when he would start to tell those stories again, I would think to myself, oh my gosh, if you ask me right now to tell those stories, even though I've heard them every year, I couldn't tell you. And I didn't know why, because it wasn't like me. I I, I loved his stories. I have a good memory. Um, And and it was was a real puzzlement to me. And then uh, at some point after my father died, which was 10 years ago now, um, I was talking to um, a Vietnam vet who said, you know, you will never know what your father went through. And I said sort of blithely, oh, I'm sure you're right. And what happened also was that uh, in about 1995, I guess it was, a friend of mine had just gotten one of the first video cameras that people would get just, you know, for home use. And um, she uh, interviewed my father and uh, made a videotape of him telling these stories. And then she gave me a copy and I was sitting in my room, put, put the, the videotape in the, in the uh, player, and I started watching it. And there they were, yeah, I've heard these stories before. And then all of a sudden, he said something that just jumped out at me. He said, I was a forward observer. And I had to turn off the tape because I just broke down and cried because I knew mm. that the forward observers would go out closest to the enemy. And I, I realized I couldn't bear to think of my father in such danger. And, and then it hit me. I thought, that's why I, that's why I kept 
not remembering those stories. Because even though the stories weren't about him being in danger, of course, <laughs> I knew he had been in danger during the war. And that made me want to learn more about his experience and the experiences of other veterans. And I also, in, in starting to listen to other veterans, um, I, I realized that 93% of American citizens have never served in the military, never mind being deployed. And most of us non-veterans are what I came to call military illiterate. We just don't have a clue what it's like to serve in the military. And whatever our politics are, whatever our views about wars or about a particular war, we, we have no clue what war is really like. And the only way to get a glimpse of that is to listen to the people who've been at war or listen to the people who've been at the military, in the military and not necessarily at war. And soon after that, um, I was talking to this friend whose brother was one of the first um, people sent to Afghanistan to serve there and, and during that war. And he had come home. And I barely knew the guy. He's a real, you know, what they call a guy's guy. He doesn't talk about feelings, that sort of thing. And um, I never really had much of a conversation with him. All I did was to say, uh, I'm glad you're home safely. How are you? And he started talking. And I just listened. And out came all kinds of stuff that would never have occurred to me. Um, and I ended up writing a piece for the Washington Post that they called for anguished vets, the listening cure. And I was saying, we, we all need to be listening to these people who are coming back and who came back decades ago because we don't have any idea what they've been through. And they are in our communities. They're part of this country. They served in our name whatever their politics and whatever ours uh, have been. And I wrote that article, sent it off, and thought, okay, well, that's that. And, and I got such warm, supportive uh, letters from vets from all eras saying, we're so glad you said that. Please keep saying this. Anyway, to shorten the story somewhat, I ended up writing a book about this called When Johnny and Jane Come Marching Home, how all of us can help veterans. Um, and um, the, the other part of this, I'll, I'll tell you about real quickly, was um, I'm a psychologist. I'm trained as a clinical psychologist and a researcher. And I was at a, a meeting right when we knew that, that the United States was going, going to invade Iraq. Um, I was at a meeting of the Association for Women in Psychology. And the head of that association, Dr. Maureen McHugh, said in a, in a meeting there, um, we all know this war is coming, and I'm wondering, is there anything that we as psychologists can do? And I, I immediately had this image of the old World War II newsreels where they showed the soldiers coming home, and I thought, oh my God, I'm afraid about what's going to happen, because what I'm scared of, and this is, I was saying this all those years ago, is this country is now more what I call psychiatrized. In other words, everything is labeled a mental illness. And then they usually put you on drugs for it or want to give you electroshock increasingly or confine you to a hospital or, or whatever. Um, I thought everything is now treated as a psychiatric disorder. And of course, there are going to be people coming back from these new wars who are struggling, who are suffering for, for various reasons, for all the reasons that, ha that have ever applied to people in, in the military anywhere. And I'm scared to death that not only therapists, but the whole country is going to say, oh, we know what that is. It's a mental illness called post-traumatic stress disorder. And here's what you do about it. You go see a therapist. Please close the door behind you because we don't really want to hear about it. Or, or we're not therapists and we're sure that only therapists can help. And take your drugs. And of course, that's exactly what happened. 
So I started, I did a white paper about that. I was the spokesperson for the Association for Women in Psychology. And then that developed into the book. And then from the book eventually grew a project called Listen to a Veteran, which I can describe if you like, and a film about this called Is Anybody Listening, which won a bunch of endorsements from veterans groups and um, awards. Well, it's an incredible story. And also, it seems a little bit like you were ahead of the curve than a lot of folks who are now working on this issue as it relates to overprescribing, prescribing of psychiatric drugs, overdiagnosing, mm-hmm. um, diagnosing things that just don't exist. Yeah. Um, so it's really interesting hearing you kind of like you, you were talking about this before you even went to war. And it's like you were looking into the future and kind of called it. And I, I wish I had been wrong. Believe me, I, I do. Um, and, and I want to tell you something else. Um, I would give a lot of talks about this, or we'd do screenings of the film. And I started out, whenever there were service members or veterans or their families in the audience, I started out by saying something that sounds very low-key and conservative, like... Um, you know, I'm very concerned about the way that whether it's war trauma from the war from a war itself, or whether it's trauma from being raped in the military, or from any of the other things that can occur in the military, or just from the culture shock of going from civilian life to the military, couldn't be more different. And then suddenly back to civilian life with little or no help in making that huge transition. Um, and I, and I, so I started out saying, I'm concerned that um, many of my colleagues, the psychologists, psychiatrists, social workers, and increasingly lay people are saying, oh, so you're upset, you're suffering about that. That's a mental illness. It's usually saying PTSD, or sometimes you have major depressive disorder, generalized anxiety disorder, bipolar disorder. Um, so I started out saying that. I, I'm concerned about that. It seems to me to add to your burden because the message of being told you have a psychiatric disorder is there's something wrong with you, not you are having deeply human responses to what you've been through. And in fact, I did one radio interview and a psychiatrist called in and he was just just furious. He said, well, of course, of course, these are illnesses. Of course, they're illnesses. They're mentally ill. They're suffering. And I said, if you think that suffering, if you saw your buddy get blown up by an IED or if your sergeant raped you, if you think that being upset by those things is a mental illness, what would you consider a healthy response? And he, of course, he didn't really have an answer. So over the years, I went from saying in that low-key way, I'm very concerned about this, to being enraged because I saw how much damage the pathologizing of these kinds of feelings and experiences were and were doing. And So now I I say something more like, I want to apologize on behalf of my colleagues who have done this to you. How dare they add to your burden by saying, oh, you're upset, and that's a mental illness, rather than I'm listening to you, I believe you, and I want to see what I can do to help you and you tell me what helps and what makes you feel worse. So over the past, say, five, ten years, what, what have you seen uh, the greatest challenges facing vets and their families, service members? You obviously aren't just pointing out problems to say, hey, this is a problem. Somebody should deal with it. It sounds like you've really been looking at, like, so what do we do? So yeah. maybe if you want to start there, what has the past five and ten years looked like? Mm-hmm. from your eyes and then what do we do okay so so the answers to those two questions are sort of combined um because i was ready to write the book and this was in 2010 in january 
And so um, my, my parents had been friends with this Vietnam veteran, Dave Jones, uh, who was from Oregon, and he had served um, and then written poetry, exquisite poetry, uh, in a book you can still get called A Soldier's Story, The Power of Words. And so my parents knew him. My father had died recently. My, they had his book. And my mother said, oh, before you write your book, you should read Dave's poems. And I said, no, no, no. I've got such a stack of notes and books, and I've got to incorporate it all. And my mother said, no, you should read it. And, I, and she's usually right. And I said, okay. And I read it. And I was just knocked out. Um, because of how powerful and beautiful his poems were. And not only that, but um, I thought, you know, here I am, I'm not a veteran. Based on what veterans had been telling me and what I'd been reading, I knew what I thought I wanted to say in the book, and I had a whole list of points I wanted to make. But um, he had made every one of those much more eloquently and based on his own experience. So I called him and said, can we uh, meet for tea and talk to you about whether you'll give me permission to quote from the poems in the book. So we met. Now, mind you, this is January of 2010. I think he had come back from Vietnam in 1972. And um, we sit down in a Starbucks and I said, well, I'm writing this book about veterans. And he started talking. And he said, yes, you can use the poems. But then he started talking about the experiences he had had. Now, one thing I learned and to take very seriously as a psychologist is if you want to learn about something, if you want to do any kind of research, whether it's empirical or, or not, you don't start asking questions if you don't know much about the subject. That may not take you to learning what really matters. So you just listen to what do the people who've had the experiences want to tell you. So that's what I did. I, di I didn't interrupt him. I didn't ask a question. I didn't say he used the term butter bar. I didn't know what that meant. I didn't ask him. <laughs> I found out later what it means about the rank. Um, I didn't give him his advice. I didn't even say, well, that was brave. I didn't because I didn't know him and I didn't know how anything I might say might affect him. So I just listened, and he talked for three hours. And then he said at the end of that time, well, I've kept you entirely too long. I, I should let you go. So I went home, sent him an email, thanked him for permission to use the poetry, and I told him I was very touched um, by the things he had said. The next morning, he wrote me an email, and he said, last night, because... You had just listened to me. I slept for the first time since I got back from Vietnam. And I was so affected by that. And at the time, I had no idea how many people come back and can't sleep. Or their sleep is filled with nightmares. They have flashbacks. So... That made me, though, want to learn even more. And I, I listened to more and more vets. And while I was writing the book, I set up a project. Um, I wrote an essay called The Astonishing Power of Listening. I thought, we should not be surprised by this, except that once again, not all therapists are problematic, shall I say, but so many of them are so preoccupied with jargon and this theory and that technique when actually wholehearted listening is probably the single most important thing we can do for people who are suffering vets their families or anybody else who's suffering and so i started this project that's when people say is it a nonprofit? i say oh you can't imagine how, how nonprofit it is there's no money um, it's called Listen to a Veteran. We first called it Welcome Johnny and Jane Home, but that sounded like a parade. So um, a colleague of mine, Howard Levy, said, call it what it is, Listen to a Veteran. And then he created a logo. It's, it's a red shape, and it's, it's the shape of a heart, but one side of it is an ear. And, and then he created these words, um, open your ears, open a heart. And that's, in essence, what it is. And it's so simple. I can tell you about it in about a minute. 
Um, all that happens is a veteran from any era, they can have been in combat or not, they can be a woman or a man, um, they go into a room with a non-veteran who either is not a therapist or they have to promise they're not going to act like one, <laughs> like a traditional one. Um, and they are both told ahead of time, there's going to be nobody else in there. There's going to be no recording of any kind. The listener is not going to take notes. And the veteran, or it can be a service member, or it can be a member of one of, uh, of their family to, who has a non-veteran listener, um, the, whoever's going to be doing the talking can say whatever they want to say. And it doesn't have to be a story, a whole coherent story. You can, you can report a memory you have, a, a smell. Uh, if you've written a poem, you can read it. You, because when you've been through something awful, that's often fragmenting. And so we don't even want to put people off by saying, you can come in and tell your story. And we have had vets come in and afterwards say, you know, when I was talking, because the listener just listened um, and, and was so focused on what I was saying, I started remembering things I hadn't remembered. I started making connections between things. I, I started understanding things I hadn't understood before, and it, it was helpful. Now, the, so that's all that happens. And the listener, or the veteran decides when the session's over, as happened that first time when I listened to Dave Jones. And um, there's one sentence that the listener begins the session with, and that is the following, which I put together by listening to what veterans wanted to hear at the beginning. And, and it goes like this. And by the way, I'm going to use the word American. Um, this weekend, some people are starting this in Canada, I'm delighted to say. Um, so what, what the listener says is, as an American, I take some responsibility for what you experienced in the military and trying to come home. And if you want to talk, I will listen for as long as you wish to speak, and I will not judge. And, and then all the listener does is to listen with 100% of their attention and their whole heart. Now, there's a second sentence that they are allowed to say if it's appropriate, and it's under these conditions. If the person speaking um, has been talking for quite a while and has talked about some upsetting experience and how it's affecting them now, and then the listener, if they want, can say the following sentence. I'll tell you, I'll tell you the sentence, then I'll tell you why. Um, they say, if I had experienced what you described, I'm sure that like you, I would be having whatever it is, flashbacks, nightmares. And I hope you know, that's not a mental illness. That's a deeply human reaction. And the reason we say that is that I used to do therapy many years ago, and I kept finding that people would come in and they'd tell me things that, you know, the way certain people had treated them and they were devastated and they thought they were mentally ill because they were upset. And almost invariably, they would tell me that the single most important thing I ever did was to tell them there was nothing wrong with them that they were having understandable responses to something upsetting. Interesting. And so that's why, and we know, we know that vets either have been told they're mentally ill, you have PTSD, that's a mental illness, we need to get you on drugs for it, or you have some other psychiatric disorder, or else, even if they've never seen a therapist, it's just tragic how many, how many service members and vets, well, what's going on in their heads is, I'm home. I'm safe now. Why am I still upset? Why do I still hit the ground when a truck backfires? Why do I have to sit facing the door with my back against the wall? I must be crazy. So some are diagnosing themselves as mentally ill. And that, that's, that's just horrible. That shouldn't be happening. So we have these sessions. We ask the, the veteran and the listener to answer three questions online right after the session and then a month later. 
And the questions are, you'll love it, you'll love this, because somebody had said, you'll have a pre and post symptom checklist for them to fill out. And I said, symptoms? Symptoms? No, this is not about mental illness. This is about human experience. And so, but I wanted to see how they were experiencing the session. So we ask three questions and they can answer anonymously if they want. We say, what if anything was good about the listening session? What if anything was negative? And what if anything surprised you? And then we ask them a month later the same questions because we wanted to make sure that they weren't just really relieved at the time, but then they go home and they're having more flashbacks. That's never happened. It's never happened. Uh, all of the feedback has been positive. And, you know, most of them say, I have never had a chance to do anything like this. Some of them say, now I can go talk to my loved ones about it. Because they finally did it with somebody that wasn't in their lives and who didn't fall apart or judge them or give them an intrusive advice. And now they can go talk to their loved ones. Or some of them say, now I never have to talk to anybody else about this. I've done it. So you think this is something that the mainstream mental health community and the VA is rightly willing to adopt? No, absolutely not. <laughs> and uh, there are a couple of reasons for that. In general, um, these people have their own professional guilds and status. Um, and when I say, well, just listen, they realize right away, oh, uh, you know, people don't get paid for just listening. Uh, and, uh, and that's not what I was trained for. And that doesn't make me sound like much of an expert. Um, and, and so they're, they're very resistant to it. Um, some, some are very, very accepting and receptive. And those are mostly people who know from their own experience as professionals how much listening itself can be helpful. Um, as for the VA, well, over the years since the book came out and then the film and then since words started getting out, about listen to a veteran, um, I would occasionally get a call from somebody or an email saying, I live in wherever, you know, somewhere across the country, and, and, I, and I heard about this project, and I thought it was so great, and I'm a non-veteran, and I wanted to be a listener, and so, of course, naturally, I went to my local VA, and I told them about the program, and I said, I want to listen to a veteran, and they said, no. And one of two things happens, and sometimes both. They'll say, the VA people will say, um, well, this is therapy, and you're not a therapist, and you're not employed by us. And so we would have to make sure you were trained properly and vetted properly. And, and they say, no, no, there's no training involved. You, you know, we really just say these one or maybe two sentences and then just listen and they said, well, then we can't do that. We, you know, it's just so different from anything they've encountered that administratively, bureaucratically, they don't know what to do with it. So they say no. It's not that they're bad people. It's more of that, like, they've got policies and procedures and this, right. whole, this, whole, this whole system of mental health that the VA has been written to function a certain way. Right. And this isn't in the script. That's right. That's right. And I want to come back to that in a second. I want to tell you one other thing. Many years ago, I met with the head of one of the major divisions of the VA nationally. And that person said to me, well, so what is it you want to talk to me about? And I briefly explained about the listening project. And that person said, well, the VA is already taking care of everything. So... No comment. Um, now, as for what the VA is doing, uh, one of the chapters in my book is called What the Military is Doing About People Suffering and Why It's Not Enough. And this, the next chapter is called What the VA is Doing and Why It's Not Enough. And um, I, I looked at press releases that had been issued by the military and by the VA in the years since the start of the war in Afghanistan. And here's how, here's how they went. And it's it just, I swear I'm not making this up. 
I'm very careful to document everything I do. Um, it went like this. Well, you know, there's so much suffering in our service members or in our vets, and we're very worried about it. And so here's what we're going to do. And, it, you know, it would be we're going to hire more therapists and we're going to prescribe more drugs. And then, you know, next press release a year later, gosh, they're still suffering and they're, the suicide rate is still high. And it's so still not increasing. Only, it's still increasing. Yeah. Yeah. And 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 they would say, so what we're going to do is we're going to embed more therapists in the units when when they're deployed and send more drugs. So they're right there. And then a year later, well, you know, the rates of suffering and suicide are still going up. And by the way, you know that 22 suicides from, by veterans a year, a, a day, that's a myth. That was based on 21 states reporting to the VA, 21 out of the 50 states, not including California and Texas, which have huge veteran population. So I always get upset when I hear them talking about 22, or now they're saying it's down to 21 or 20. It, it, you know, something fishy has gone on with, with the data there, with the reporting. But it doesn't matter. It could be one a day, and that's, that's of course, too many. Um, but while, while I was, while I was uh, uh, working on, on the book, um, I met a psychologist at one of the major VA hospitals. And I told him what I was writing about. And I said, so tell me what you do. And he said, well, uh, he said, I, I, uh, I recommend things like um, mindfulness and meditation and involvement in the arts and volunteer work. And I said, that is terrific. I said, when, when I get to the part of the book where I'm going to be writing about what, to, what we can do, uh, can I interview you? And he just went pale. And he said, well, you can't use my name. And I said, oh, oh, I said, does your supervisor not know you're doing these things? And instead of, you know, therapy and drugs. And he said, um, he said, well, uh, you, you just, you just can't use my name. And I said, that's okay. I won't use your name. And he gave me his card and he never got back to me when I reached out to him because as you say, that's not what they're set up to do. And as long as they're just doing therapy of various kinds and drugs, whether it's CBT or, or um, a cognitive behavioral therapy or exposure therapy, which I think is horrible for most people, um, you know, having them relive the, the terrors um, or, or the drugs, um, as long as they're just doing those things, those are considered standard of care. So if a vet doesn't get better or kills themselves or tries to kill themselves, then their defense, the, the VA's defense can be, and the military's too, can be, oh, well, we were just following standard of care, but they're scared to death that if they do these far out sounding things like recommending mindfulness and meditation, which a Seattle VA doctor has data about, about how much it has helped veterans, um, but they're afraid, oh, that sounds fringy. And so we're afraid we'll be accused of not implementing the right treatments. Meanwhile, as you and Bob Whitaker wrote in your brilliant paper about drugs and the VA and suicides, um, these drugs are increasing the rates of suicide. And so it's just this tragic irony that they shy away from approaches that don't require you to diagnose the person as mentally ill, and they shy away from approaches that have little or no risk, like meditation, for goodness sake, or writing poetry, or drumming, or taking an improv class, or gardening, or volunteering in your community. Um, and, and so in 2011, in November, right before Veterans Day, um, I organized um, uh, a, a conference at Harvard Kennedy School called A Better Welcome Home. And, you know, it was Harvard, so we had to have a fancy subtitle. And I think it was something like Transformative Models for Helping uh, Veterans and Their Families. And we had, it was a unique conference because instead of people getting up and speaking for long periods of time, um, I brought in 28 people from all over the country 
one from the Department of Defense, one from the VA, uh, a bunch from the private sector in various ways. Um, and each one of them we filmed speaking no more than five minutes and they weren't allowed to use jargon. And each one of them just said, my name is so-and-so and here's what I do to try to help. So there was a woman who trains service animals. There was a woman who ran uh, the, the veteran uh, writers project. Um, I talked about my listening sessions. The guy from the DOD talked about physical exercise. Um, somebody from a couple of lawyers talked about um, providing legal aid for veterans who were having various kinds of legal problems. And so there was an enormous range. There is a website that has these 28 short videos on there. And I, the Pentagon has asked for this information. Five different people there. I hope they're using it. Um, and what I urge, whether it's a vet, a service member, a family member, or anyone else, non-military, who is struggling or suffering, go to the website. I'll tell you in a minute how to find it. And scroll down and look at things, what, what resonates with you? Do you like animals or do you like the arts? And click on the videos, the short videos that are of interest to you. And then if it's something you'd like to try or get someone close to you to try, um, the contact information for the person in the video is there. So if you want to be involved with service dogs, this woman is in Illinois. So you can contact her if you're there ask her how to get a service dog, or do you want to be involved in training service animals, or do you want to know who in New Orleans is doing this sort of thing? And the way to find it, rather than giving this long, complicated link, is if you put in the, the search bar, if you put in parenthesis, sorry, in quotation marks, Harvard Kennedy School, and then right after that in quotation marks, a better welcome home, and then YouTube, that website will come up. And I just have to warn you, a couple of the speakers sort of deviated from the topic, but most of them really kept to the subject and, and people are finding them very helpful. Again, this all keeps coming back to what we're doing might be causing harm. Yes. Is, is kind of the overall message I'm taking from this, that one of the things you said is that the, the, the VA... Uh, and, and individual VA medical centers may be reticent to do what are currently considered alternative therapies because of liability issues for not following their standards of care. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's right. An interesting look at it could also be, though, is that they may be protecting the individuals, but what if the standard of care, the, the policies and protocols and procedures at the VA, if, if this is found to actually be causing harm, it could actually leave the VA liable. Well, yes. And, 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 and not in an indiv individual case, but like thousands of them. Yes, that's right. And well, I, there's, there's absolutely no doubt about whether or not they're causing harm. And I actually had a meeting at the Pentagon with the person who was then head of behavioral health for the, for the Pentagon. And, um, and he was not a psychiatrist or a psychologist. I think he was a thoracic surgeon. And I went there to say what I've just been saying here, that, you know, I'm really, con I said it very politely and respectfully, sir. Uh, and I said, you know, I'm concerned that um, the therapy and drugs approach is, is not helping. Look how, many, look how many veterans from previous wars are still suffering horribly. And so if therapy and drugs had helped, you know, we wouldn't have so many suffering so badly. And I, and I told him about these various alternative approaches. And then I, I steeled myself and I thought he was going to say, well, who are you to, you know, talk to us about? And you know what he said? He said, I totally agree with you. Yeah. And then what I learned from many people in the DOD and many people in the VA that those is that those um, those entities are um, they're so entrenched in their bureaucracies and procedures and hierarchies that it's very hard to make change like that. As well, well, it's also not just making small changes or tweaks here. <laughs> we're, we're, I mean, we're talking about restructuring of VA mental health. Right. This is not just 
we take another look at our prescribing practices. <laughs> this is because because that is like the 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 that is the practice uh, of mental health. There, uh, this is we have to do all the stuff that we've historically considered uh, non traditional therapies need to be the traditional therapies. Right. It would be, it would be a revolution. Exactly. It'd be a revolution of mental health within the VA is what it would be. Let let me say a couple of other quick things. One is that I even wish they wouldn't use the term mental health because that, you know, suggests the opposite, which is mental illness. And there's no decent definition of mental illness. And none of that, none of those diagnoses are scientific. I, I was on two committees that wrote one of the editions of the psychiatric manual of diagnoses. And I learned to my shock, none of it's scientific. None, there's no such thing as whatever these diagnoses are, that people suffer in different ways, sure. but there's no scientific legitimacy or validity to bipolar disorder, or anything, or PTSD. People suffer and people need help. And these diagnoses get in the way. And so, and it's been shown through a lot of research that veterans and military people are less likely than anybody else to go, to be willing to go to a therapist anyway. So why not say, look, there are VA facilities that offer yoga classes for their employees. So open them up to the people who are veterans who are seeking help. And right. don't say, and you have to get a diagnosis to prove you're psychiatrically ill before we'll let you take a yoga class or connect you, you know, with, uh, with a, a, an improv acting class. The other thing I just want to say real quickly, um, one thing I would wish we could stop doing is talking about art therapy, music therapy, drama therapy, The arts and volunteer work and those sorts of things are enriching, they're life-affirming, they're helpful, they're healing. And who am I to say that, Derek, um, you you need art therapy and your buddy can take an art class? Why pathologize everything by calling it therapy? Why not just let a vet go take an art class? I mean, I don't want to go down the rabbit trails of explaining that there's a lot of money tied up in this. Yes, that's, yes. And <laughs> degrees tied up into this. But just something to think about, just something to keep in mind. No, it, and it sure is. It, Paul, I can't thank you enough on behalf of Madden America for joining us, for sharing your thoughts. We're really only halfway into this conversation, it feels Um, Thank you for what you're doing. And can I just give, if there are any veterans out there who want to have a listener or um, any non-veterans who want to be a listener, if you go to just in all lowercase, um, just spell that, listen to a veteran.org. You'll see the way to get in touch with us at the very top of the page. There's a very brief video of me talking about uh, how how the project got started and what it involves and 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 the positive effects it has and we'd love to hear from you. Well, Paul, thank you again for joining us. Uh, to all of our listeners, thanks again for following, listening uh, to Mad America and, and specifically uh, Mad America's Military Veterans and, and Families Initiative. Uh, if you'd like to uh, learn more, you can go to our website. Uh, and I'll be hoping to have uh, more information and more uh, articles actually coming from Paula because Paula is an incredible resource and uh, we're really fortunate to be able to have her as a contributor with this organization. So uh, on behalf of Madden America, thanks again and look forward to talking next time. Thank you. Me too. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to the Madden America podcast. Visit maddenamerica.com for more news, views and updates. 